features of it. We have playgrounds, we have for ourselves as a metropolitan museum, but that's not what this park is really about. We're going to talk about it in its entirety. We're going to talk about its design holistically. And I'm going to tell you about it. It's 150 years, no, 135, 137 years old, and we're going to look how it changed over time. We're going to look at how it was built. We're going to look at how the different facilities that were in the park on top of the historic plan. We're going to talk then about how it deteriorated and was almost lost. And then we'll talk about the Central Park Conservancy. So first, here is the historical design of the park. Now, we're starting with Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Fox. And they were the winners of a design competition in 1858. And so these are really, this is the, the design that we go back to today in our vision of what this beautiful, naturalistic, historic landscape. The template, the beginning, uh, is here in the 19th century. And look, at, you can see the beautiful winding paths, one formal element, the great mall going to the Bethesda Terrace, the ramble of beautiful woodland. You have uh, essentially beautiful meadows, you have this great romantic rural space, rural seeming space, right in the center of New York. And this is the North End. It was built around uh, the, the reservoir, which was there to begin with. It's called Central Park because this was the central reservoir bringing pure drinking water to the city. So we're going to look at it whole. We're going to look at the design uh, in its entirety. And here's what it looked like in 1857. And you can see that it's mostly a barren ground. It has poor soil and these rocky outcrops. And so the initial task in making the park involved blasting the bedrock, using some of it as part of the design, uh, excavating and reshaping the landscape. And so the low-lying marshy areas, oops, the low-lying areas had to be dredged. You had to bring in a lot of topsoil. You can see they're really building this park. So don't think when you visit New York, that they just put a wall around a piece of nature. This is a completely designed landscape. And it required a great deal of engineering in order to create its complex infrastructure of drainage and water supply. Now, can you believe that all the scenery is man-made? and that these streams are artificial. Their water comes from the reservoir in Central Park, that reservoir that we just looked at in the original design, and it's distributed through a system of pipes and concealed valves, and the same thing is true of the beautiful lake. I took this just a few days ago. We're having spring here, we're having fall uh, in uh, North America right now. And here uh, is an example of the way in which the landscape's contours were regraded in order to make a gently rolling meadow. Topsoil is brought in, grading. All of this is being done not with machinery in those days, but with men, manpower and horsepower. Notice um, how these rustic, 
wooden bridges and shelters reinforce the notion that Central Park is a piece of rural countryside transported to the middle of New York. It's a very idealistic vision that when they saw that this was going to be a great metropolis, that they would need to have this kind of respite for the people of the city from the busy, noisy city. And um, you have uh, a comprehensive, integrated circulation system. Uh, and this required bridges to separate pedestrians from horseback riders and uh, on the bridle trail. And it also required stone arches under the carriage drives so that there would be no conflicts between different modes of, of uh, moving around the park. You can see this is probably the first example of grade separation of traffic in New York, these are the transverse roads. And this is incredibly important. There are four of them in Central Park. And so it required the blasting through the bedrock and excavating these four sunken channels to the transverse roads to carry the east-west park traffic through the cars, the trucks, you can see what it was like in the beginning, the carts and the people and the animals, uh, through the park without interrupting the essential park experience. And it works wonderfully today. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> let's see what was accomplished botanically uh, by, let's say, 1872 when we consider the park has been more or less built. Of course, it's always being created, as you know, over time, nothing uh, stays still. Uh, five million trees and vines had been planted by that date. The 42 species of trees and shrubs that were listed when the park site was acquired in 1857 had increased to 612. There were 800 and 15 varieties of hardy, perennial, and alpine species as well. There were two nurseries inside the park, which had been set up to cultivate the seedlings that were then planted in the park. And it's clear from these statistics that before the founding of the New York Botanical Garden in 1891, that Central Park was New York's de facto botanical garden. I'm happy we're in a botanical garden today. Central Park was the horticultural showcase, 1895. That function of a botanical garden, official botanical garden, became the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx. As I just said, nothing remains the same. There is the statistics on the trees that were planted. Uh, nothing remains the same. Uh, least of all, a public park, which has changed uh, much over the years. And you can see that Central Park has had several lives. We can divide its 137-year-old history into roughly five eras. We need to call this the plan of Olmsted and Box is called the Greensward Plan. Okay, this is the Greensward era. 1858, when the park was begun, to approximately, let's say, 1900. And then we have the first recreational era, which is 1900 until 1934. I'll show you in a moment why that 34 is a precise date. Uh, and that is the uh, Robert Moses recreational era. Then we have um, what I think of as the hippie uh, era. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, the restoration, which begins around 1980 and goes to the present. Now, going back to that 
Greensward era, let's look first at what has not changed. And these are the park's wonderful bedrock outcrops, the tough mica schist that is the underlying geological formation of Manhattan Island. In fact, geology played a large role in the Greensward plan. In some places, such this is called Umpire Rock because it's near um, the ball fields in the south end of the park. And here's something, take note. Uh, see, the rocks are beautifully sort of smoothed and polished. What happened? The glaciation, we're talking North America, glaciation came down to really just about this point, you know, goes across the Midwest. And as it moved in a southeasterly direction, as this great thousand wall sheet of ice is moving across this landscape, these are the eroded stumps of an ancient mountain, mountain range, and it's moving over them, and it's grooving them, as you see, and polishing them as it goes. And here, this is what I think is particularly, I love this uh, detail. And this shows you uh, how the um, stonemasons were at work, how, how incredibly, uh, really talented the people were that, that built the park in the first place. You can see how they've actually, uh, this is an invitation to climb the rock. They cut steps into some of these rocks. And so think um, of the stonework that was going on. And here are more of those rock cut steps. And also, um, I want you to notice that, see the masonry, all of the walls, all of the, the, the um, cut stone comes right out of the park. It's all built of this same uh, bedrock, the Manhattan Schist bedrock. And I really just love these big bedrocks. They're great presences in the landscape, and they, they give it, I think, a, a lot of character, and they help define the root ways, the roots of the pathways. So Olmsted and Vox, they used nature. They blasted through the rocks. They shaped the park. They created it like a sculptor would create a work of art. But they also used the rock outcrops as part of the uh, landscape design. Here, this is um, where you can see that it's uh, actually um, you have the stonemason sort of smoothing off this and creating a wall, and they run the path along the wall. And here on the bridal trail, they've actually cut through a massive piece of bedrock and channeled the, the bridal trail through the park. This is where I run in the morning. It's near where I live. Um, so uh, you have to think also of the park when it was under construction as this immense work site. The bedrock that was blasted away furnished a good deal of its building material. And here, uh, you were looking at the stream that is named the Gill, uh, and it's a man-made brook like those waterfalls I showed you earlier. And it runs through the Ramble, which is this beautiful artificial um, woodland landscape, and then the gill empties into the lake. And its stream bed and waterfalls were created by combining these fragments of blasted bedrock that had been moved from elsewhere in the park. Uh, and here you see how this lovely little stream, again, totally artificial. And here um, we see how the lake's edge, the rocks are used, they help to define the edge of the lake. And again, I show you how the, the uh, masonry uh, is cut and then used in building walls as well. So 
that is the, we want to talk about uh, the circulation system. And we've already spoken about this. We've spoken about the importance of the transverse roads. Uh, and we want to look, though, now at the entire circulation system and what makes up the park as experience. And you move from one area to another. And what I want to leave you with is this notion that it's experiential. It's not the features, remember, not the, the museum or the carousel. It's how you experience the park as you move through it. Look at how the beautiful winding paths. You can see uh, the, the way in which uh, the circulation is conceived. This is a very uh, 19th century romantic, picturesque way of designing parks. It comes out of the English landscape, the great um, park landscapes, the state landscapes of England uh, in the 18th century. And then the notion that it is a very naturalistic way to carry you on these curvilinear paths throughout the park. And also, uh, notice how the original park architecture was carefully integrated into the landscape. Here we see the Belvedere, which is built of the same Manhattan shifts, and it seems to simply grow right out of the bedrock. And here is the lovely dairy, and it has, again, a very sympathetic character. This is not like the buildings. Much as we love the Metropolitan Museum, it's a massive uh, classical building that is put in the park at a later date. This is the kind of original park architecture. But, as I said, the Greensward era's emphasis on beautiful scenery as the park's core experience began to change as a new generation with different ideas about the function of a public park came into being around the beginning of the 20th century. At that time, there grew up the desire for more physical forms of recreation. Well, ice skating had always been popular. That's really not a problem at all, because in those days, this is before uh, we had such a warm microclimate after all the buildings were built, and also with the problems that we have now with uh, global warming. Uh, but tennis players come in, okay, that's all right, but it does a little damage to the lawns. It's no longer considered scenic recreation. We now have physical forms of recreation. Here, uh, remember, baseball is just a new sport in America. Well, uh, we bring kids in, we have baseball. That's fine too, but it does do a little damage to those beautiful meadows. Uh, and, but then, what happens? These are the changes that occur. We begin to have tennis courts. Now, instead of having what I call multi-purpose, flexible open spaces, we have designated single constituency uh, places within the park. And this is my least favorite building. This is a, um, it's a swimming pool and, and ice skating rink in the winter. And we don't want to take these things away, but I think you have to admit they are quite uh, an encroachment on that original landscape. And here is, I mentioned the name, Robert Moses. And these active recreation facilities were built by Robert Moses, the man who reigned as park commissioner from 1934 until 1964. And reigned, reigned is the right word, because Moses, who could have cared less for Olmsted and Vox in the park as the scenic symphony of pastoral and picturesque areas, uh, was a virtual czar 
of public works in New York for three decades. And in wearing his parks hat, he built hundreds of playgrounds as well as, this is all around the city, as well as numerous swimming pools, beaches, ball fields, and basketball courts throughout the city. In fact, what's wrong with that? I mean, he was a hero um, to the people. Times had changed. Play facilities are what everyone wanted. And this was a time, though, when much of Central Park's original scenery and rustic character was destroyed. And here's an example. I mentioned the rustic structures. All right, here we have the original, oops, I'm sorry, um, the original rustic structure uh, that sits on top of this beautiful rock outcrop. And this will give you an idea of the typical Robert Moses facilities architecture that was put in the park. That's uh, a chess and checkers house. Okay, Th this is for want of a better name. I call this the hippie era. And during the years of Moses' administration, the park was well maintained on a daily basis. The regulations were enforced. However, by the mid 1960s, um, things had radically changed. This was a time when America's youth culture sought to take over the world, uh, or at least Central Park. And soon, in terms of its management, the park was completely out of control. Oh, I don't know whether some of you are old enough to remember, but this was a time of happenings, love-ins, protest marches, park rules were simply abandoned in this kind of anything goes atmosphere of mass events. Uh, it was the beginning of free concerts in the park. And, you know, there was just a lot of happiness in the air. Um, but the next day, a lot of garbage on the ground. And there were just a large number of these events. And there was unregulated sports use. They played football on this sheep meadow. And with all of this um, and the lack of rule enforcement, uh, these green meadows just turn to dust bowls. And you can see the slopes of the park are eroding. The tree roots are exposed. This is the beautiful stonework. I'll look at more of that in a moment. You can see how uh, the uh, dirt is simply washing down the slope and um, pushing uh, and eroding the, the stonework. And you have graffiti on every possible surface, uh, both those that were built by uh, Olmsted and Vox in the Greensward era, uh, such as the beautiful little Belvedere castle that I showed you, and those built by um, Robert Moses. Okay, this brings us to my part of, of the story uh, and the founding of the Central Park Conservancy. The idea of a public-private partnership in support of a city-owned park was unknown at that time. And I thought that if a private board of 19th century commissioners working with the city and state officials of their day could get the park built in the first place. A group of 20th century citizens could also form a board and work with the mayor and park commissioner to help make Central Park clean, safe, and beautiful once more. Okay, 
So we have the founding of the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, well, in, um, <clears throat> first of all, I was appointed by Edward Koch, the mayor, uh, to be the first Central Park administrator. We created a title. This title didn't even exist. And so uh, in 1979, I became Central Park administrator. And I look like I'm patting his head, but it's really uh, the day that, that this uh, announcement was made to the press. So it's the first, as I mentioned, public-private partnership organized uh, for this purpose in the United States. You had public-private partnerships if you want to think of the public library or um, the museums or the botanical gardens. They were, from the beginning, institutions within parks. This is the first time that the park itself has a structure that involves private citizens in its restoration and management. OK, people always ask me, you know, what, what are the four things, what are the things that you need? I say, you need, first of all, the vision. And then your organization has to have a strong mission. And you must have good planning and design. And that design, it has to be comprehensive and piecemeal. Not piecemeal, I'm sorry. Comprehensive, but not, you know, we'll fix up this, we'll fix up that, we'll do something else. It has to be, you have to look at it. Look at your park in its totality. And so it has to be an integrated landscape and not a bunch of random projects. So we did a tree survey. We looked at the location, the species, the diameter, approximate age, and the condition of the park's population of trees. There were excuse me, 26,000 uh, at that time. Uh, we also discovered something very interesting. When we mapped the tree canopy and compared the vegetations of the early park and the current park, they were quite different because what you see is where the beautiful meadows, you know, stretched and, and formed a kind of long visual experience. Trees, naturally, they grow up and they self-propagate. And so we had this constriction of our open spaces. And I want you to realize something. It's very important to say that these are not original trees. Trees don't live forever, and particularly in the kind of environment in the middle of a city. Uh, so uh, maybe there are only, I don't know, two uh, trees, three perhaps, that were actually planted back there in uh, the 19th century. Uh, so the ones that have grown up and multiplied, they represent successive eras of, of planting and also self generated growth. A lot of the trees just self-propagate. Um, and for like all but biological organisms, they, they have their natural uh, lifespan, and they're subject to damage from pests and diseases. And you know this because we're in the botanical garden. Uh, and the natural climatic events, such as hurricanes and high winds. Therefore, the ones that exist in the park now are those that have grown up uh, since mm, approximately the middle of the 20th century and, and onward. And of course, this process is still happening today. So what, what else did we do? We mapped all of the eroded areas. I showed you some of them a moment ago, but we mapped all the eroded areas, including what we termed as desire lines. You can see those are on the map I just showed you. These are the desire lines. Desire lines are the places where people no longer stay on the paths, but they take shortcuts, and this erodes the lawns. I bet you have examples of this here in uh, your park. We tested the water. We tested the soil. This is all the inventories we did as we began 
to prepare our management and restoration plan, wildlife survey. Now, I want you to, to know that we call it a management and restoration plan, and we go back to the user study. Who are the people that we're managing this park for? This is back now, remember. This is not today. This is back then. Uh, in, we did the survey uh, between the surveys, the 10 surveys, between 1982 and 1985, and that's what gave us our information for developing a management and restoration plan. And you'll hear me say this word management a lot because, and not master plan, it's management that counts. And that's why we put the word first because if you can't manage what you restore, then it makes no difference. Um, I showed you the, the user constituencies. Uh, you know, there's, there's Roller skating, there's, you know, everything goes on. Uh, but what happens is once you restore the park, people come back. You see, this is the Great Lawn. Believe me, it wasn't back then like what we just saw. It was a dust bowl, the Great Dust Bowl, I called it. And this is the published version of the management and restoration plan I just mentioned. And we did publish it. And this was very important because not only does this still continue um, more or less to guide this on, on restoration never stops. I mean, there's still projects that are happening that go back to this. There are some restoration projects that we've done that we re-restored it, keep them in, um, in their beautiful uh, state in which we restored them. And of course, here are some of the things that we did. We Removing the 50,000 square feet of graffiti was one of the first things that we did. And that brought, that was a signal that management was back. I have, this is an aside, I have to say, I think some of this graffiti in Rio is really cool, and that, that you've got some terrific graffiti artists that are going around, uh, and I'd like to know more about that. But the graffiti in Central Park was really, it's what you call the tags. People were just, you know, writing on the walls, and it was not so nice, and it was definitely um, getting rid of that on all those surfaces. 50,000 square feet of graffiti, and um, it took about three years. That gave a real signal that management was back. We also uh, repatinated, cleaned and repatinated the statuary. It was all covered with this copper sulfate corrosion that turns all the statues green. So cleaning and repatinating them was one thing we did. That I showed you earlier, the rustic construction, returning some of that, um, let's say, flavor to the park, the bridges and the boat landings and the summer houses. This is a beautiful little gazebo that's near 67th Street and 5th Avenue. And the light has all, so many lights were broken, you know, maybe two-thirds of the lights. And they had this awful off-the-shelf manufactured uh, luminaire and by redesigning, uh, designing a new luminaire that still looked sympathetic to the historic lampposts, uh, we created a new uh, aesthetic for the park. And then we have uh, the turf management, bringing back uh, lawn mowing. We have turf crew. We have the Conservancy is sponsoring all this. It's still half run, no, maybe a quarter run by the city, and as it grows, the conservancy gets stronger and is doing more and more of these uh, management building activities in the park. And you can see this is the condition of the Harlem Mirror, the lake 
that's in the north end of the park and restoring that. And you see how we use the same kind of aesthetic again, the way in which I showed you the earlier lake and the way the rock outcrops are defining the edge rather than this hard uh, concrete uh, structure that was built in the Robert Moses era. And here, uh, I took this about, um, you know, just this past week, and uh, she's his own gardener, and, and she's in the park, and so are the other 49 zone gardeners, uh, picking up the trash first thing in the morning, but then with horticultural training. Um, all of this is, is really fairly new planting. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, here, and you can see how um, this all has to be cared for. And they go around in these little scooters and, you know, perform these tasks. Th none of this zone management existed. And I want to say that you have to have accountability. And having a conservancy employee in a specific part of the park makes a huge difference because without a system of management in place, as I said, I keep coming back to this, uh, there's just no point in restoring the park. And so with these trained workers who are accountable for individual zones within the park, uh, it is a, without them, it's a disservice to the donors and the city taxpayers to spend money for projects that can't be maintained when they're completed. Uh, now, before I end, I want to just quickly show you some before and afters where zone management and well-organized park crews have been key to the Conservancy's success. Okay, this is the East Meadow. Here we have, this is where the, it's called the Conservatory Water or the Model Boat Basin slope going down to that. This is our beautiful mall, that central axis, the one straight axis uh, for promenading in the park. Shade tolerant grass and good tree pruning and tree care. These are American elms, one of the most beautiful trees, particularly for uh, overarching a, um, a, a promenade like this because nothing has this great branching pattern, I think, a vase-like shape, uh, and it makes it look, you can't see it so well in that slide, but it, it's really like walking, you know, through a cathedral. Here is the, uh, it's called Cedar Hill. Now you see, I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the turf crew and the keeping the grass in good shape. This is called Cherry Hill. Uh, it had been turned into a parking lot we took away the parking lot. We put the original fountain back uh, on the slopes, which look like this. We replanted them. And this is Strawberry Fields, which most people know about. This is Yoko Ono's. For, this is a very important gift. It was a million dollars. And we put $600,000 into the restoration and uh, 400000 into an endowment to pay the salary of our first zone gardener. Now, the sheep meadow, that's the way it was originally. Again, I told you about creating the, the vision of a rural countryside in the middle of the city. They had sheep grazing on the sheep meadow. That's why it's called that. Here is what became of the Sheep Meadow. I mentioned all the concerts and the happenings and all of those things. And now, we also talked earlier about infrastructure. So in order to restore the Sheep Meadow, we had to put in the under drainage system again, system of pipes. And then we had to roll out new sod. We had to put in topsoil and, and the new sod and so this is what the sheep, what sheep meadow, excuse me, looks like today. Now the Great Lawn, 
I said earlier, it's the great dust bowl. Here it is again, and here it is in its restored state. And remember, zone gardeners are keeping this and also turf crews uh, and the planning crew. This is what is keeping the park looking this way. Maintenance is just critical. And that's the dairy. I showed you that earlier. You can see it was didn't have the loggia. We had to look at old drawings. We even used postcards sometimes to see what the original structures had looked like in the park. Uh, that we showed you earlier. That is the Belvedere, the little castle that uh, is uh, right at the north end of the Ramble. And this is how it now has been restored and serves as an environmental education center. Here is we showed you the terrible picture of the, uh, how uh, the Harlem mirror had become uh, silted up. And this is the boathouse that Robert Moses had built. You can see it's abandoned and it was burned out and the copper sheathing on the roof was taken off. And so we built a new structure there. And uh, instead of a boathouse, it is an environmental education center. And at the mall, uh, again, zone management, each of these things I'm showing you, they represent zones in the park. Uh, here is the original uh, mall, and I mentioned those beautiful overarching elms. You can see uh, the elm trees lining this one straight axis in the park. And this is what had happened. This is what it looked like when they uh, paved over this part of it. Uh, they created these little tree pits. Well, of course, you know what happened to the trees. So we put back the original um, park benches that also acted as fences, and we put in the planting beds. And we still are planting American elms there. Uh, stonework had been you know, the heads of the birds had been knocked off and lots of the stonework was damaged. And so we had worked with sculptors and we uh, put back a lot of that stonework. And I showed you that earlier. This is the beautiful Bethesda Terrace. And so now you can see the slope is no longer eroded and that's all been repaired. And the beautiful fountain in the middle of the Bethesda, ter Bethesda Terrace which no longer functioned. Uh, that is what it looks like now. And I showed you earlier how that stonework uh, was uh, being, you know, completely uh, falling apart. And you see again, you know, all the graffiti everywhere, the rocks, the, all the stonework, the buildings, and repairing that and actually putting back something that was very interesting. We call them gonfalons, these beautiful fishtail banners that they had in the 19th century. Naturally, they had disappeared, and so we put those back. And these are, you know, design touches that bring the park back. They're, they're actually, you don't restore a park, you can't restore a park to exactly its original condition. But by bringing back some of these lovely touches that they had in the original landscape of the park, it's a memory of, of the historical park. And you can see that people come to the park for many of the same reasons. We said that uh, relaxation, enjoying the park, hanging out, sitting on benches, uh, this is still what people come to the park for. Uh, the promenading on the mall was why the mall was created in the first place, and you can see people still use it that way. The boating on the lake uh, is still a very popular activity. And here we have, we're going to end here, on the Bethesda Terrace, all restored, and the boating on the lake, and behind the Bethesda Terrace, you have the mall, which leads down you know, to this part of the park, and then it sort of dissolves back into its naturalistic uh, 
glory. And so that is what I have to say. Now, I'm not going to do this now, but if there are any questions later about facts and figures and, and how many people work in the park and what the budget is and things like that, I have four slides and I can run through those quickly. But I thought that um, for now, maybe because we want to have our discussion, uh, and I think we have another presentation, uh, and so we should uh, end my talk right now. Thank you very much. Did I go over too long?